Welcome everybody to the first webinar in a webinar series on the impact of the COVID crisis on the real economy, on people's health and the global financial markets. I'm Markus Brunemeyer, the director of the Bentheim Center for Finance here at Princeton University. And I'm particularly welcoming here Thorsten Slock, the chief economist of Deutsche Bank, who will tell us today about the global financial markets dislocations occurring because of the oncoming crisis due to the coronavirus. Before we start, let me just give a quick interview overview what's going on on the people's health dimension, on the real economy, and on the financial economy. So we are considering the implications on people's health and the contagion effects, and depending whether we do social distancing and undertake other mitigating measures. We have two scenarios in front of us. If we don't, without measures of mitigations and to slow down the infection rate, we have this blue hump-shaped uh, infection rate coming up. And this will surely exceed the capacity of the healthcare, healthcare system with much more dramatic outcomes for people's health and the death rate, mortality rate in the world. If we go for social distancing and other mitigating measures, then probably and hopefully we can bring it below the capacity of the healthcare system and have a much longer lasting uh, virus outbreak, but not so intense and not so short run. So essentially there is a dimension of gaining time in order to prepare the healthcare system for this contagious virus and hopefully mitigate uh, the implications for people's health. So the people's perspective is the first thing. Of course, it has implications for the real economy, depending what we are doing, which strategy we are going, which might lead to a V-shaped or L-shaped or U-shaped uh, scenario for the real economy. In the real economy, there are more broader implications. Of course, the initial shock is a shock to many supply chains in our globalized economy. So we have supply chain, supply, supply disruptions, but we also have disruptions on the demand side. So many goods are not demanded anymore. We can't go to restaurants and other features. And there's of course hoarding going on and this hoarding actually leads to more demand of particular goods. Here we see a picture where people are hoarding toilet paper, which seems a very highly demanded commodity at this point. So that's about the real economy. I will talk more about the real economy as well. And then we have the third component. We have the financial markets. And as we know, financial markets are typically not so stable. They're subject to runs and contagion risks. And here we have two contagions. We have one contagion, which comes from the health side, from person, people to people, but we also have contagion in the financial markets. And of course, all these three elements, the people's, health component, the real economy implications, and the financial market implications, they are all interact in uh, significant ways. And to understanding these interactions and looking at various market data is useful to get a better picture of how to mitigate the implications of this crisis. The first question, which is an interesting one, you know, if we compare the economic hoarding from the real economy with financial runs from the financial markets economy, you might see some similarities. Both is a financial run with drawing money from the bank account or from the money market account. Isn't it the same as just hoarding money? And indeed, there's the same forces at place. If you hoard food and with, if you hoard money, in both circumstances, it's individually optimally to do so. You bring your own, you put your own safety first but you lead to a collapse for the social good, collapse of the whole system. So that's typically the case. Individual optimal behavior is suboptimal for the society. But there's a big difference between the economic hoarding and the, versus the financial hoarding in terms of financial run. The big difference is that with financial hoarding, the central bank can intervene and just print money and calm down the, the set. Okay, and that's not the case with economic hoarding because economic hoarding means you have to provide food or you have to provide toilet paper, whatever people are hoarding. That's not easy for a central bank to do. To provide additional funds, it's very easy. It's in a digital money. You can just print at a mouse click. You can just transfer 
in funds to a particular bank which needs it and there's no issue for printing money at a lightning speed. So while there are similarities in economic hoarding and financial hoarding, there are also big differences in terms of policies, what you can do against, you have to, for economic hoarding, you have to come back to different policies. Now let me come to the shocks. In the shocks itself, there are different elements. One is the shock itself, and one are the amplifications, the knock-on effects, second round effects, and the fourth. And in terms of the initial shock, there are different interpretations. So we characterize shocks in different ways. Here, I think we talked about already temporary versus permanent shock. So we have this virus outbreak, which is a big shock. And how long it will drag on depends very much on the mitigation efforts, the social distancing we do. We can have a very sharp short-term shock, which has different implications on the economy compared to a very long run slow shock, which might be more detrimental uh, for the economy. So that's whether we have a V-shock U-shock or L-shock, it's different. Uh, uh, you might have different preferences for the health perspective compared to the perspectives you have on the real economy. The other classification of the shocks is supply versus demand shock. And this turned out very useful, this distinction in the 1970s. If you have a negative supply shock, it typically leads to high inflation. If you have a negative demand shock, it typically leads to low inflation, depressed inflation, or even deflation. And in the 1970s, we realized how important this distinction is. In this case, in this environment we're facing now, the initial shock is a supply shock. But so as I mentioned before, it destroys supply chains and other elements. People can't go to work anymore, which is labor supply is interrupted. But it immediately has also demand implications as well. People get scared, save more, and demand fewer goods, they can't go to restaurants anymore. So it's both a supply shock and a demand shock, and it's less useful uh, to make these distinctions compared to earlier crises. Finally, we distinguish between aggregate shocks and idiosyncratic shocks. Idiosyncratic shocks hit everybody differently, and in aggregate might wash out. Here we have a classic aggregate shock. It's a global shock. There's no country which is pretty much spared from the shock. It's globally, and it's very, very aggregate. So it's important to make clear how to classify this initial shock. Now, once the shock happened, that's only the starting point. And then suddenly everything is amplified. All the knock on effect, the feedback effect, the spirals and non-linearities kick in. And typically what we observe, in particular in financial markets, we observe a shift from a risk on environment to a risk off environment. Earlier, people were willing to take on a lot of risks. Now we move to a risk off environment people are not willing to take on this risk anymore. Equally important and related to it is this flight to safety phenomenon. People want to fly into safe assets. A safe asset is like a good friend. A good friend is around indeed when you really need it, him. And a safe asset is the same. If when there's a crisis, it gains in value and it gains in liquidity. That's what a safe asset is and people rush into it. So a safe asset, is like a good friend, there's this good friend analogy. And a safe asset is also an asset which is safe because it's perceived to be safe. So there's a multiple equilibrium story behind it. So there can be two assets which are fundamentally the same, but one is perceived to be safe and the other one is not perceived to be safe. And then people rush into the safe asset and make when the asset endogenously safe, while the other asset, which is not perceived to be safe, is not safe because people are running out from it, running away from it. So you can see this flight to safety, this multiple equilibrium story uh, showing up as well this in here. So the shocks and amplification knock-on effects are very important to understand. And we will come back and um, to us, we'll come back to this uh, phenomena where they show up in the real markets. Now, what financial markets are we talking about? What are the important markets? And everybody talks about the stock market, the high volatility we recently observed in the stock market. I would like to focus a little bit more on the credit and funding markets. Who needs funds? Of course, the government goes into debt. The government needs funds. They issue treasuries or government bonds. The businesses issue uh, corporate bonds or loans from the banks and households issue mortgages. And there are two channels of funding. One is the channel is through the classical capital markets and shadow banks. And the government corporate bonds issue some long-term bonds, government bonds, treasuries, or corporate bonds for corporations, and also short-term for uh, debt 
for working capital, companies have to issue some commercial paper. So there are banks who issue commercial paper, but also to a large extent, firms issue commercial paper. Now, this corporate bonds and commercial paper, they ultimately funded often by money market funds. So household and other firms put money market funds by money market funds, and then these investment funds or money market funds to then hold these other bonds. And in between, there might also borrow and lend. There's a lot of activity going on. You might need some bonds as collateral. So you use some of the government bonds, the US treasuries, for example, or German bonds um, as a collateral, or you use some corporate bonds as a collateral to do repo transactions. So instead of borrowing just naked without any protection, you give the lender, uh, the borrower gives the lender as collateral some of these corporate bonds or government bonds, especially German bonds or US treasuries. So there's a lot of activity going on. And what's important is not to neglect that market making, there's a lot of you know, readjustment going on. And for this market making, you need somebody who steps in between the buyer and the seller. Because the buyer and the seller might not want to do the transaction the same millisecond. So there's somebody step in between and has to take on some of these positions in, in between. And this is our market makers. And the big phenomenon which occurred is that the market making, which was typically done traditionally by the big banks, investment banks, moved much more in the shadow banking arena done by hedge funds and other players. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a big change after the global financial crisis. Now the traditional bank financing often occurs through banks. So corporations and households, corporations get loans from banks, or households that get mortgages. And of course, banks need also the funding. They have deposits from the households, but they need other funding as well. So among the banks, there's the interbank market. There's a lot of lending and borrowing going on in the interbank market. Again, you often using repo arrangements and also unsecured interbank funding. So that's somehow the funding structure, which is much more critical. And we will see that the current crisis is primarily driven by problems in the corporate market, in the corp by the corporate borrowers, large financial corporations whose cash flow, cash inflow or revenue is just breaking away. And that makes it much more risky, corporate bonds much more risky. While the earlier crisis was much more on the household side, on the financial side and the household side. So this one is much more a problem for the corporations in the corporate bond side. And that's important uh, if you want to handle and solve the crisis uh, later on. Now on top of it, we have uh, for an exchange market. So we have the whole global aspect to it. So currencies are floating around as well. And here the flight to safety comes, comes in again. If we go from a risk on to risk off environment, capitals will flow away from the risky emerging economies to safe havens. And the safe havens are the US dollar, the Euro, the Japanese yen, and mostly into current, into government bonds like the German bond or the US treasury, uh, which are considered as very safe. So there are huge uh, capital flows, international capital flows from more risky emerging economies to uh, safe havens. And they lead to a lot of dislocations, a lot of adjustment and huge currency adjustments. Typically, uh, the US dollar is appreciating tremendously during these phases. And with swap lines, the, the US Federal Reserve tries to lean against it by lending dollars because there's dollar shortages everywhere. Um, and of course, European investors who hold uh, some long run corporate bonds, they will try to get US corporate bonds through um, investment funds or money market funds, they'll probably will try to get out uh, of these as well as the corporate bonds get more risky. Now, uh, let me end with a few questions, which I think are very important to answer. So the questions are, do financial markets overreact or is it just a reaction to the new environment? Okay. So the policy response, of course, is very, very different. If you just think we, we have a new environment and we just have to live with this new environment. The world is more risky, we have a fundamental shock. It's not a shock coming from inside the financial system. It's coming from outside, coming from the, the virus itself, which initiated in China. Uh, does it matter 
whether the markets overreact. Why does it matter or what does it not matter? And should central banks care about the stock market primarily or should they care much more about the credit and funding markets? And then on which credit and funding markets? Is it more providing mortgage funding to households to buy houses or is it much more providing funding to companies whose revenue stream is going away? What are the implications then on the labor market and the unemployment rate? And should it provide also funding for market making where certain players in the financial sector you really bring buyers and sellers of financial assets together and that's breaking down and that's why everybody is withdrawing and that freezes leads to a, a, a funding freeze for many firms because the secondary market is not working anymore. And then if you come to the conclusion that the central banks primarily work through financial markets and the banking system, you might come to the conclusion that this government should find some ways to restore funding by bypassing the financial sector altogether. It might be the financial sector might not pass on the funds if you just give it to the banks in the hope they will pass it on to the final corporate sector or whoever is in financial need. And the different schemes out there, there are a list of different schemes. Let me just outline uh, two of them. One is a loan scheme, which I proposed with some fellow European economists, a liquidity lifeline proposal uh, to throwing a liquidity lifeline. And the idea is essentially to channel funds to small businesses, to restaurant owners, to barbers and, and others whose business is undermined in the current circumstances. And they probably have to declare bankruptcy if they receive no help. And the idea is to give them through tax authorities big injections of liquidity relief, and then they have to repay uh, these loans that are granted over the next say eight years, also through an add-on on their taxes. What's the advantage of that? That means this loan they're getting is, has highest seniority because it's actually collected by the tax collector rather than through a private arrangement. So it has seniority of all other debt obligations. Of course, the public sector comes in late and helps out and stabilizes the system. And like an IMF loan for countries, in this case, everybody will get through the tax authorities and with the help of a development bank in uh, certain countries, immediately relief, liquidity relief, and it will be stretched as a zero interest rate loan. It will come back uh, also levied on the taxes as an end on to the taxes. That's one way to do, go for it. The US is trying is proposing a different scheme at the moment, which is not a loan, but just a gift. So you give it away uh, without any hope of being repaid. So everybody gets supposedly a thousand dollar check or even more. And that just the IRS, so the US Treasury is giving everybody thousand dollars in their checking account without the obligation they ever have to pay it back. Of course, it's way more expensive and only few countries can afford to do so without bringing the government into financial difficulties. So that's why this loan arrangement is, is more feasible, especially for also emerging economies and other economies. And the US approach is very much like a helicopter drop of money done by the fiscal authorities. And actually Hong Kong did a helicopter drop of money. Uh, while what's less effective about the helicopter drop of money, of course, it goes to all individuals, to individuals who need it, and also individuals who don't need it. And if you might say some little owners, uh, smaller medium enterprises, that might if giving them thousand dollars might not help them much. And you can't keep your restaurant open if you have an extra thousand dollars, it won't do much for you. And giving some other potential customers thousand dollars will also not help because they have no way to go to a restaurant in these current circumstances. So that, these are the main questions. So with this little overview, I want to now pass it on to Torsten, who will go much more into details and what happened in the market in the last few days and what are the long lasting um, implications and the outline of what potential demolition measures uh, could be to overcome the current challenges. So Torsten, I pass it on to you. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. That's a, an excellent overview exactly of um, what are the 
uh, frameworks and the ways to think about what's going on at the moment. Um, one thing that we are thinking, one thing that we're thinking a lot about at the moment is, of course, what is the nature of this shock relative to other shocks that we have seen. And what's very important to keep in mind here is that we have a shock that is the virus. The virus is closing stores. The virus is keeping many of us at home. The virus is basically holding back economic activity, both in the form of sales in companies, and also in the worst case, the risk of course is that it also will begin to have negative consequences for unemployment, and it also will have negative consequences for how long time we have to stay at home. And therefore, the GDP impact of the virus itself is of course what ultimately ends up being the most important part of this debate. The knock-on effects of what we're talking about today in this discussion is all about financial markets. In some sense, what the ECB and the Federal Reserve and other central banks around the world are trying to deal with is not so much the first problem as such of dealing with the virus. That can only be dealt with by the data for the virus beginning to flatten out, that the growth rate and the number of new cases beginning to flatten out. But what the initiatives from the Fed and the ECB have been doing is to try to make sure that the financial system is not creating knock-on effects that are additionally negative for the economy on top of all the negative consequences of stores being closed and as we saw today jobless claims numbers going up. So I thought about how can we discuss this in a simple way and think about where we are and I still think that the most helpful way for discussing this is really as I've written here in the outline to think about this sequentially. What was the state of the world economy before the virus? What were the important issues going into any discussion of what is the impact of the virus, both on the economy and also on financial markets? Then I have a few slides on the virus itself. We all spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the, the spreading of the disease and containment measures and what different governments are doing. Uh, I will talk less about that, but only look at what does it look like developments in the number of new cases around the world and also in the number of deaths around the world as a result of the coronavirus. Then I want to turn to and spend most time on number three, which is the most interesting thing for this conversation, namely, what have financial markets done? In other words, how have markets traded and why have they traded the way that they have? And what are the consequences of what we're seeing in financial markets at the moment? And again, just to reiterate, the consequences and the side effects of what's going on in financial markets is not something that has as such anything to do with the virus, but just more has something to do with what is the reason why markets are doing what they're doing. And we will walk through, as Marcus also just explained so well, different financial markets, stock markets, credit markets, uh, money markets, and try to have a look at what have we seen, what has the data done, and also in that discussion, what has the Fed and the ECB and other uh, central banks around the world are done to try to limit some of the stresses that we have seen in markets. And this is number four. Uh, we can talk about this for a long time separately. Uh, this I will spend a little bit less time on, but this is a very important topic also, namely the Fed and the ECB reaction. And then of course, number five, uh, which is a much, much broader issue. I'll just talk briefly about what the fiscal policy reaction, even though this is also extremely important, but for the conversation today, we wanted to focus on number three, which is why I have most pictures for number three, namely from financial market reaction to the virus. And finally, uh, we just published in Deutsche Bank in my economics group, our uh, GDP forecast, as difficult as number one to five is, uh, we have a view and we have produced some charts that I will show you at the end, what we think the economic implications are. So. With that, let's start first at talking about what was the situation for the US economy before the virus. And I should have said this, as I go along, Marcus, if I say anything that you would like to debate and discuss and anything that you think is um, unclear or you would like to debate further, please uh, just interrupt and uh, we will take the discussion as we go along. So before the virus, if we look first at the first chart that I have put in here, uh, this chart shows you what is the situation in the terms of number of recessions that we have had for, if we go back one page here, uh, let me see. If I'm still showing the one with debt, if we can go back. Can you, can we slide one, one page back here? Uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, this is not behaving. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's just take the next one. Uh, can you flip forward one page? Delania, Marcus? Oh, is it? It looks a little bit frozen. Um, it's a PDF file, so it's 
page up, page down. Okay, we'll uh, just do page so down. Up, uh, forgive me here. Uh, it's not really, let me try again. Oh, oh, sorry, now we went too far. Okay, so before the virus, I'm sorry, forgive me for that. So before the virus, an important starting point is, of course, what we've been debating um, uh, in the, most of uh, the second half of last year, namely, we've been through a very period where we have not had a session. And the chart is telling you uh, the number of months that the US economy was in recession. And as you can see, going back to 70, 76, we basically never before came without a recession, like you can see in the chart. So the starting point was that we had a long period where we didn't have a recession. We had a long period that the economy did go through uh, two negative quarters of growth. This, of course, is important because that tells you that there were a number of things that had continued for a long time in the economy that basically had provided a situation that was a bit special, which is exactly what you see here in the next chart, namely that we had relatively high debt levels going in to the virus here in February. Uh, and why is that important? Well, this chart here shows you at the global level, debt levels for households, which is the blue bar at the bottom, for non-financial corporates, which is the red bar, for the government, which is the light blue bar, and the purple bar is for financial corporates. And what's most interesting in the current context is that corporates in the red bar have actually increased their debt levels. Well, I'm not sure why it's flipping, but they have increased their debt levels uh, quite substantially. Uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years, whereby the red bar is higher and at a more elevated level than it's been for a long, long time. Another way of saying that is that issuance of investment grade credit, of high yield credit, of level loans was very, very pronounced over the last uh, six, seven, eight years, simply because of negative interest rates, simply because it was so attractive with low interest rates for corporates to extend the duration of their debt to issue more debt. So. An unfortunate aspect going into the crisis was that debt levels turned out to be relatively high. And that's, of course, unfortunate because once the virus hit, now, of course, corporates that have to roll over their debt need then to think about, well, how can we roll over our debt? What are the costs of rolling over our debt in investment grade credit, high yield loans elsewhere in credit markets if you suddenly have a much higher level of corporate debt than we have had? before. So the starting point, and this is the important part of these two charts, is two things. We have not had a recession for a long time, and at the same time, we had a situation where debt levels across the board were just higher than they had been for a long time. So what did happen here a few weeks ago, and uh, what has the development been in the data in terms of the number of cases, uh, meaning the number of individuals in different countries that have the coronavirus. And this chart here is a chart that we uh, update and send out every day. Uh, because this shows you, importantly, uh, the benchmark for those countries that have been able to stabilize the number of cases of coronavirus. So if you look at the text below the title, this shows you cumulative confirmed cases of coronavirus. And as you can see, China in the black line, they had, as you can see, basically uh, three, four weeks where they had a significant increase in the number of cases, and then it started to flatten out. Uh, now, of course, from a market perspective, we're spending a lot of time then thinking about, okay, so this was the Chinese experience. Uh, there's also the Korean experience in the yellow line, which also has begun to flatten out. And we have also seen in the Japanese data, uh, which as you can see here is the dotted black line at the bottom, that also has begun to show signs of flattening out. So this is opening up a lot of conversation and I will just very briefly mention, namely about what are the right containment strategies, uh, what have different countries done, uh, what is a successful way of doing this, is what Italy is doing a successful strategy or not, there's a lot going into whether you should expect to see different strategies work different ways. But the main conclusion in this chart here is that while we debate that, what is absolutely critical in our view is to then monitor how is the number of cases actually developing and are we seeing a flattening out of the curve as uh, Pierre Olivier Corinthians has been talking and writing about also, are we seeing a situation where we begin to see the flattening out in the data? Because ultimately this will also begin to mean that we should begin to think about how do we flatten out the impact on the economy. And this chart here shows you in the cumulative number of cases. And what you have here on the next page is the cumulative number of deaths. Uh, this is also for the same country, same colors, 
also an important debate. There's a lot going into the first chart in terms of how many tests are being carried out. But this chart, of course, this is um, also very importantly measuring in terms of are there any signs of flattening out and the data generally improving. And the broad picture, as you can see, is that some countries are on a lower trajectory, so it's a little bit early. Other countries are, of course, seeing the data move higher. So at this point, it just remains a little bit too early to come to any strong conclusions that we are seeing the world beginning to see stabilization in the number of cases and in the number of deaths. So with that backdrop, of course, the virus continues to, of course, create a lot of uncertainty, both, of course, for markets, uh, but also ultimately, of course, of the question that we're all most interested in understanding, namely, how long time will it take before we get to the end of this shock that the economy is being hit by? So let's now turn to what's the most, uh, 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 what was the part of this uh, the conversation here uh, that we're talking about, namely, try to look at some different pictures of what's going on in financial markets and what have financial markets done in response to the virus. One very simple way of thinking about financial stress is to look at financial conditions measures. And the OFR, the Office of Financial Research at the US Treasury, has a daily financial stress index. Bloomberg has a daily financial stress index. We in Deutsche Bank also have various measures of financial conditions. And you can do this in many different ways. In technical terms, as you know, how this is done is essentially throw different variables, the stock market, credit markets, uh, repo markets, funding markets, investment grade, credit spreads, high yield spreads, throw that into the kitchen sink, do principal components, and then ask the question, what common variation do these series have? Can I draw a chart that in one picture shows me how tight or how easy are financial conditions? More sophisticated ways of doing that is then to ask the question, I'm not only interested in a picture of what that looks like, I'm also interested in a data series that is highly correlated with GDP or highly correlated with the economy. So the different levels of sophistication in terms of how people think about financial conditions all have to do with what am I trying to explain? Am I trying to explain what GDP, what unemployment, what the economy will be doing? But no matter how you do this, these measures generally show the same thing that you see in this chart here, namely that you're seeing at the moment a fairly significant tightening in financial conditions. So now you could say, okay, so what does chart tell me? This chart does tell you something important because it tells you something about how tight are financial conditions today relative to past history? And of course, the benchmark that we constantly focus on is 2008 and 2009. So the first observation when you look at this is to say, okay, uh, financial conditions are definitely tight. There's no doubt about it. I'll show a number of charts in a minute that exactly explain what the issues are. But it's nowhere near as severe as it was in 2008 and 9. But it is as you can see in the chart, a little bit worse than the Euro crisis in 2011. And that of course also tells you then, okay, maybe if I think about what the macro consequences are, maybe I do need to go back and look at, well, what happened in 2011? Or if you wanna go back to 2016, when the energy sector started to move very quickly because oil prices moved down, then you could start thinking about what was the uh, adjustment period? What was the episode that we went through to try to understand why is this, severe and how long time will it take before we get to the other side of this tightness that we're seeing in the moment. The next question of course is on the next page that we have seen uh, which gets the most attention of course the stock market decline quite dramatically. There are various ways as you all know too well you can talk about this. Uh, one simple measure of this is this chart here which is the Bloomberg measure of what is global stock market capitalization and as you can see in round numbers the global stock market capitalization has dropped from 90 trillion to roughly 65 trillion. So now if you take your economics textbook out and think about this, this is a fairly significant negative shock to wealth. So that means all our discussions about the wealth effect. In other words, the marginal propensity to consume out of a hundred dollar decline in wealth. What are the consequences for consumer spending? And that entire literature will tell you, well, that depends on the duration of the shock. If we just go down here and we go up again, well, then this might all be temporary. But the longer time the stock market stay at these low levels, the higher are the risks that this will have more long lasting consequences. So in a nutshell, the fear of course you can have is that if the stock market does stay down, then this is the best picture in terms of the second round of the knock on effects coming from the financial system. Remember this chart really has nothing to do with the virus as such. The virus is already closing stores. The virus is already creating problems for corporates. But what is critical here is that the knock-on or the second derived effect, if you will, of financial market stress is causing a number of problems 
overall when you think about the negative consequences for the economy. And looking at this, of course, over time, and we tried, and this is uh, embarrassingly simple, just to ask the question, well, this decline in the stock market was very quick. And in fact, this was the fastest uh, decline in the stock market uh, that we have seen ever in the history of the S&P 500. Uh, and what we mean here is, it's very important, the details of how this is calculated, but look at the subtitle here. The number of days that it took for the S&P 500 to enter a bear market was only 15 days, and a bear market, of course, means 20% decline. So that's, of course, telling you also that this came literally out of the blue. It was not something that was brewing for a while. We just had the previous peak uh, very uh, uh, near us here in, in February, and now falling very quickly down to the low level that we have seen here in March. So, of course, then you turn to the next question and say, Can okay, I ask so you a quick question, Thorsten? Yeah, Marcus. Do you think that the stock market is more important than the credit markets in this case? I mean, we are back to the level of 2017. Nobody complained in 2017 that, uh, you know, the stock price and the wealth effect is too small. Or it, is it more a confidence thing? Or is it more a level of the wealth which makes the difference? And Absolutely. So this is a really critical question. I think the stock market, at least at the broadest level, is most important for consumers. Uh, because most people in the US, as you know, of course, also will have their savings in their 401ks. So in that sense, you could say, well, why should they care? The stock market is just back to, as you say, where we were a few years ago. Uh, but the reason why that's important is more from a consumption perspective. Credit markets are important for a whole different reason, namely that that's very important for businesses to keep the doors open, for businesses to operate, for businesses to manage their cash flow and be, manage uh, the duration and the length of, um, uh, of that debt. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, both markets are important, but they hit on different sectors of the economy with the corporate sector mainly being hit at the moment by what's going on in funding markets and going on in credit markets. Whereas the stock market at the very broadest level, at least, uh, when you think about at least from a purpose, the Fed's model of the US economy perspective has a more important impact through the consumption equation. In other words, the impact that it might have on consumer spending. And this also gets to this. Another question by Anna Wilson, who asked whether we were anywhere in a late cycle world, and hence it's not so surprising that you know there's some correction, and some correction is normal at this stage. Absolutely, uh, the fact that we are late cycle, and the fact that we have built up debt levels to relatively high levels, in some sense, made us more vulnerable because that is the debt that now needs to be rolled over. That's the debt that now will be more vulnerable as credit spreads or investment grade credit and high yield credit and borrowing for corporates is higher. So the higher debt level you have, and in particular, if that debt is more concentrated at the bottom of the credit stack in terms of lower rated credit, the more vulnerable we will be. So that's a really good question. And that's an important question that because we are late cycle, we are simply therefore in a situation where credit has been given to a wider range of companies, including companies with lower credit quality that will and be and are more vulnerable in this current situation. And in some sense, a lot of this is summarized in what you see also on this chart here, namely the levels of VIX and the level of vol also for treasuries. Uh, here you certainly can see that the level of volatility, this is implied volatility in uh, the red line is in stock market and the blue line is implied volatility in uh, rates markets. And as you can see, the implied levels of volatility are at extremes, namely uh, here essentially at the same level as they were at in 2008 and nine. So now you could say, well, wait a minute, I just said that financial conditions are not as bad and as tight as 2008 and 9, but this is telling you, well, we are now on some measures in terms of volatility at a tight level that is similar to what we saw during the financial crisis. And the reason why these are at these tighter levels is because of an underlying theme and a lot of the following pages, namely that equity markets and treasury markets are very liquid, whereas the problem has been in credit markets, the credit markets have been less liquid and this is, of course, what you're beginning to see. When you see moves the way that we have been doing in the last several weeks, you begin to see the circuit breakers kick in. So that's another way of saying, whenever the market moves 7% to the upside or 7% to the downside, trading is simply halted. And it is, as you can see here historically, somewhat unusual that you have had so many circuit breakers in such a short period of time. Uh, this is, of course, highly unusual, but it just tells you that when you fall very quickly in financial markets, and you move the stock market and uh, many other markets as much as they do at the moment, circuit breakers do begin to kick in. And this has of course shown up in some of the funding markets that you also mentioned from the beginning, Marcus, namely uh, in particular, of course, money markets across the board where you begin to see also signs of distress as illustrated in this chart here. 
So the blue line is LIPA OAS, the red line is FRA OAS, uh, and the black line is the, the basis, uh, meaning the uh, extra additional money you have to pay uh, if you want to uh, hedge um, uh, your FX position uh, across different currencies. Uh, and as you can see, in money markets, in other words, if you are a financial institution or in any other money market fund participating in money markets, this picture here tells you also in very, very plain English, it tells you, well, how distressed are funding markets at the moment? And this chart here also gives you a picture that is similar to what we saw before in terms of financial conditions that you can see live OES, it's widened out. And uh, so this is the blue and the red line, and this is on the left scale, as you can see. But again, it's nowhere near the levels that we saw in 2008. Uh, likewise, the basis also has been widening out, but that's actually not too far away from where we were just a few years ago. So funding markets have been more distressed, which is another way of saying borrowing on a three month basis in financial markets between banks, uh, between the various institutions. Also in a moment, I'll show you a travel commercial paper, basically have been showing more signs of distress, broadly speaking, uh, in this case here, this is now the blue line is commercial paper markets. The blue is for financials. The red is for non-financials. This is a spread over OIS. And again, the, again, to talk about this in very simple words, this is also showing you that we're not at the levels, at least in the, the blue line where we were in 2008, whereas on the red line, namely for non-financials, for corporates, we've seen a level of distress that's slightly worse than what we saw in 2008. That of course has to do with the general issue that we've moved in 2008 and 9, a lot of the problems were in the banking sector, but today, and this is at the core of these charts, many of the problems are in the corporate sector, which is why, of course, the Fed tried to uh, do uh, uh, the commercial paper funding facility, which has been helpful in the last few days in terms of stabilizing the funding cost for companies that issue, say, we, if we are non-financial corporate, we can issue a three-month paper. And then, of course, that three-month paper to make sure that there is a market for that and make sure that there's a funding market if someone who buys that. Uh, then, of course, the Fed now has opened the facilities that we used during the financial crisis to make sure that this can also be funded, that these assets also can be used to raise cash and uh, make markets, very broadly speaking, so that financials can get cash and so that ultimately, at the end of the day, financials can keep their businesses. Can running. I ask another question about this uh, commercial paper, which is uh, short-term papers, which... Uh banks or corporations issue. I couldn't see on this chart, would you argue that for the corporations which issue short-term debt to the market, the situation is now worse than 2008, 2009, based on your chart? I, I couldn't see the blue line, how high the blue line goes, but for the banks and the financial institutions which issue some short-term debt in form of commercial paper, the situation is not so bad as it was in 2008, 2009. That's exactly correct. So in some sense, in, in very broad terms, in 2008 and nine, it was a banking sector crisis and we didn't have as much distress in the corporate sector. And today it's the complete opposite. Now we have more signs of distress in the corporate sector and less signs of distress in uh, the banking sector. And this of course is also now spreading over to credit markets more generally. This is uh, the uh, level of yields in investment grade credit and high yield. So what we spoke about in the previous charts are pictures of very short term credit markets, meaning very short term funding, meaning if you are a company and you need money for the next month or three months or six months, what are the conditions and what are the costs of borrowing? Now we're looking at the indicators for the index for investment grade credit and high yield. And you have also seen some widening out. So now we are asking the question, okay, maybe there's some issues in short term financial markets but what about the longer term outlook for corporates? How have markets responded to this distress that we're seeing in the corporate sector? And as you can see here, both for investment grade credit and high yield, we've seen a move higher. What's interesting about this is that for both of these lines, it now also gives you the impression that, uh, well, okay, the previous page showed you that in the very short term, there's some issues about raising cash for corporates and keeping money markets um, liquid and running. But in the longer term, if you think about the duration of these two indices, which is for IG and high yield, uh, four and eight years, uh, but that longer term funding, it's also gone up a bit, but in the blue line in particular, investment grade credit is still trading at levels that are not extremely distressed. It's gone up very quickly. And the red line has moved back to levels that we were at in 2016. So one very important point of course, is that in terms of the cost of borrowing, if you think about this, about the macro consequences, we have moved higher, but we have again not moved up anywhere near the levels that we saw 
in 2008, which has to do with exactly that the duration of the shock has so far been relatively limited. Thorsten, can I ask you certain questions which came from the audience? Sebastian Gay from the CDO asked whether you can talk about the 10 year spread, why the 10 year gradually went up so much. And then there are a lot of questions about the corporate defaults in energy, whether you think uh, the energy sector is particularly concerned. And what are the effects, Chris left is asked, what are the effects of these corporate difficulties for the labor market? Yeah, so and those are really important questions. So the first question is that um, the reason why loan rates have gone up and the reason why at the same time uh, equities have gone down, it has to do with the treasuries and equity markets are the most liquid markets today. So a very important feature of the charts that we just have walked through here are that those markets are basically not functioning as well as they normally do. In other words, they're not very liquid. So if you are a portfolio manager and you have losses in some parts of credit, let's say you have investment grade credit portfolio and you would like to either liquidate that or you even would like to buy some more of that, but that's just very difficult when there's very little liquidity in financial markets. What do you do? Well, you then start to look at those assets that are more liquid. And the two asset classes that are most liquid is treasuries and equities. And that's why the highly unusual thing in the last several weeks, in particular the last 10 days, has been that we have seen equities go down. And at the same time, we've also seen treasury bond prices go down. In other words, US stock markets went down and rates went up. You would normally expect that if the stock market goes down, then interest rates would also go down. But simply because there was a scramble for cash, there was a scramble to sell the most liquid assets, that meant that we had a situation where instead of the normal relationship that the stock market goes down and therefore long-term interest rates also go down, we had that the stock market would get, went down, partly because people reassessed the value of the future cash flow for companies, but also because equities was much more liquid than many other asset classes. And the other asset class that also was liquid was treasuries. So the important answer to your first question here, Marcus, is that the reason why you have seen this breakdown in the correlation between equity markets and treasury markets, I mean in treasury rates, is because they are the most liquid markets. In other words, they are not trading on quote unquote fundamentals, but they're trading on simply on the other feature that they are much more liquid than what you're seeing in credit markets. And to the other issue about, of course, energy, it's true that including if you look at the chart I have up at the moment here, namely this is the uh, now the spread on high yield and IG. Uh, and now you can also begin to think about where are these spreads relative to history. Again, they are not where they were in 2008 and 2009. Uh, but it's clear that if you go back and look at the red line in 2016, uh, a lot of the reason why high yield widened out in 2016 had to do with the energy sector. And the energy sector, of course, played a very important role at the time. And there is also a number of issues going today into the energy sector because oil prices have been dropping. I mean, if the global economic growth starts slowing down, then you also have that oil prices go down. And on top of that, we had some disagreement in the OPEC here uh, just very recently, uh, the previous weekend, which also on the supply side means that the supply of oil was also going up, which is the reason why oil prices have been going down and have been causing also uh, a lot of uh, challenges for the energy sector more generally. So yes, it's true, the red line here is going up, uh, importantly also because of some of the specific uh, stresses that we're seeing in the energy sector overall. Uh, and the final thing that you asked about is the important thing also about what's going on with the employment numbers. And of course, the thing that we spend most time on on that is the employment data. Uh, we got jobless claims earlier today, and unfortunately it has started to go up. And we are very worried about this vicious cycle that financial markets are distressed and uncertainty about how long time the virus will last. And if we are at the same time begin to see the unemployment rate move higher, that will begin to cause uh, more uh, challenges, of course, for the economic outlook and uh, for the overall picture of how uh, deep this slowdown will ultimately be. Just a few slides. I know um, I'm running through it here uh, uh, relatively carefully, but this is just, as you know, there are other markets than cash bonds for corporates. This is just the CDX for high yield and IG. This has also moved up. Unfortunately, that doesn't go back all the way to what we saw in 2008 and 9. And what you also can see on this page here is uh, different credits uh, and what this, I know there's a lot of lines in this chart here, but this is just telling you, if you go back and look at, look at where this was trading in all of February. In all of February, you basically saw all these things trading relatively stable. But what is the most important feature of this chart here is what I have written in the title, namely, we're beginning to see more significant differentiation in credit markets. 
and that differentiation is exactly beginning to ask questions about which companies have high levels of cash, which companies have low levels of cash, which companies are more vulnerable to a shutdown in retail, uh, which companies are more vulnerable to issues that have to do with the distress in financial markets. So I'm not gonna go into all the different types of credit that you're seeing here, uh, but the bottom line still is uh, that there's more differentiation in credit at the moment, as you can clearly see, than we've had a long time. And this continues to, of course, be a very important feature in financial markets. Another way of talking about this is to look at the trace data. Remember the trace data shows and talks about what's going on overall in um, credit markets. Uh, and this chart here shows you, if you look at the, the, the footnote that I've written here, uh, distressed bonds are bonds trading at more than a thousand basis points over the benchmark treasury. Uh, so if you look at the number of distressed bonds on the left axis, you can now see that we're up to almost 700 bonds are trading more than a thousand basis points uh, above the benchmark treasury. And, and I, I, you don't get the Nobel Prize in economics for this correlation in this chart, uh, but you do begin, of course, to worry about that the consequences here are, uh, of course, potentially quite severe the longer this shock persists, uh, because the fear, of course, is that US GDP will ultimately be vulnerable if a lot of these companies are not able to roll over their debt if a lot of these companies ultimately will have to let go workers simply because the funding cost, meaning the costs for their debt, as you can see in this chart here, is unfortunately very elevated at the moment. Another feature that is a more a longer perspective on this is to think about what's going on in investment grade credit. As you know, investment grade credit is a much bigger market than high yield, uh, but this chart here shows you the composition of the investment grade credit market. And as you can see, if you go back in time, it used to be the case that triple B, which is, as you know, the lowest level of investment grade, made up 25% of the index. And as you can see today, it now makes up about 50% of the index. So this has opened up a conversation in credit about, well, what if you have a fallen angel problem? What about the stock of triple B or BAA that's outstanding, which has grown significantly? What if that begins to be downgraded? Couldn't you have a more severe situation of distress in financial markets? And this chart here shows you just some numbers to that. If you go back to 2005, this is the, look at the text below the title, the market cap of Bloomberg Barclays corporate indices. And as you can see, the market cap used to be 2 trillion, meaning the total size of US corporate credit markets was about 2 trillion. And today, the total size of US corporate credit markets is about 7 trillion. So it's grown about 5 trillion. And as you can see, the gray area, which is the BAA, which is essentially the same as the lowest level triple B of investment grade credit is when we have seen the most growth. So the fear, of course, in some market participants view is that in the gray area, you might see downgrades. And if they begin to be downgraded into high yield, then of course, this will open up all kinds of questions of those who hold the IG index. What would the consequences be if you begin to see those downgrades come along? Of course, an important aspect of this question is to ask, okay, so who are actually the holders of U.S. corporate bonds? And this chart here, if you look at the text below the title, is holdings of corporate and foreign bonds as a percentage of corporate and foreign bonds outstanding. And if you look at the red line, that shows you that foreigners today are actually the biggest holders of U.S. corporate bonds. And why are foreigners the biggest holder of U.S. corporate bonds? Well, that's because you had negative interest rates in Japan. You had negative interest rates in the euro area. And as negative interest rates started in 2014 in the euro area, and as investors and pension funds in Europe and pension funds in Japan and in Asia started looking at negative interest rates, well, the conclusion was that, okay, I don't like negative interest rates as an investor, so maybe I need to buy assets that are giving high yielding returns, and I need to buy assets, in this case, that were corporate bonds that give me a little bit more credit risk, but if they're investment grade credit, which is the biggest corporate bond market, of course, in the US, then the consideration was that this was, and still continues to be, relatively safe assets. And that was the reason why, if you look carefully at the chart, in 2014, the red line began to go up. Not only did the stock of corporate bonds increase, but you also saw the share that was held by European investors, Asian investors, also continue to move higher. Then the red line has been moving a little bit up and down again here more recently, but the bottom line is an important issue is that a lot of corporate bonds are today held by foreigners. So Ines Swirtle from the Capital Magazine asked whether you know this has some connection to the dollar surge. What is the dollar shortage? If the foreigners were to sell the corporate bonds, what are the implications for that? And then there's some questions from Jean-Pierre Landau asking, what are the implications of algorithmic trading? Is this totally different now than let's say 10 years ago? Do we have more 
And finally, we focused a lot on corporate defaults, both about household defaults, Pallavi asked from uh, JLT Simpson. Yeah, so to the first question about the dollar, uh, I mean, this chart here tells very clearly that uh, a lot of foreigners have been investing in US financial markets. So now you're thinking about what the dollar has been doing during this crisis. I may or may not be the next page, but one, one, one aspect of that important question is this one here, which shows you, I know this is a, a little bit um, into the weeds, but this, if you look at the text below the title, this is the one year hedging cost for dollars in annual yield. So this is a rolling six months FX forward. You could do this as a three month or 12 month forward. But this chart basically tells you if I'm a European investor in the red line, if I'm a Japanese investor in the blue line, what are the hedging costs for me if I consider buying US fixed income? In other words, if I buy a US fixed income asset and I want to get rid of the FX risk, what are the costs for me of covering that risk? And as you can see, the hedging costs have been going up in for several years when the Fed was raising rates and the ECB was keeping rates stable. And then, of course, as the Fed began to lower rates in 2019 and the dovishness came in, then we began to see the hedging costs come down. More recently, we've seen uh, some pretty wild swings in the hedging costs because we have seen some pretty wild swings in what's going on in, uh, let me just see if I can flip forward. Uh, let me skip these few pages here uh, and get skip forward quickly to that to that important issue, because this has to do also with what's going on on the FX side and the reaction that you have seen, namely between bonds and treasuries. As you can see in this chart here, this shows you the interest rate differential between U.S. 10-year rates minus German uh, bonds, 10-year bonds, and as you can see, we've seen a significant decline in U.S. rates relative to German rates. So this is, of course, from a portfolio perspective, beginning to open up questions about, as a portfolio manager in the US or abroad, how should I think about my portfolio and asset allocation in an environment where you suddenly have that the attractiveness of US yields, as you can see, has really started diminishing and deteriorating very, very quickly. Uh, so with this backdrop, the issue is important to your question that, well, the foreign appetite for U.S. dollar funding and the foreign appetite for U.S. assets and U.S. treasuries has continued to be relatively strong. But and the dollar swap lines being open also tells you that there's dollar funding uh, distresses in some parts of the financial system. But broadly speaking, uh, the issue why the dollar has gone up has been because of this issue that we are seeing all this appetite for dollar assets at the moment relative to what we normally see. So maybe I should just get to the conclusion. I know we're already running towards the end and this chart here shows you exactly what we have observed, namely the dollar index has gone up. It hasn't quite gone up above levels where we were in 2017, but this is a very important function of this issue that there's a dollar funding need that many different institutions and many different investors would like to have dollar assets and want to buy dollar assets. There's also a lot of discussion whether the virus problem is bigger in Europe and emerging markets in the US and all those things also feed importantly into discussions about what you think the FX implications will be overall. Let me just end and then I'll make sure, I know we're already at one o'clock here in New York, but I'll make sure that we have time also for just a few more questions. But let me just end with a few slides on the fiscal policy reaction. I won't talk too much about this, uh, but what we are of course most worried about in this situation is what I mentioned earlier, namely the unemployment rate going up uh, and a very uh, simple way, of course, of trying to figure this out is to do various uh, alternative indicators. So what we tried just to do was to Google uh, or look at the Google data for how many people are searching for file for unemployment. And you have seen an increase in that, which is consistent with what we saw in the jobless claim numbers today. And one very important aspect of this debate is also to think about that the, a lot of the problems with the virus is really in small and medium sized businesses and not so much as such in S&P 500 companies. And what I mean by that is what this chart here is telling you. If you look at the text below the title, this is the global employment in S&P 500 companies is only a 17% of total US employment. In other words, in round numbers, 85 to maybe 90% of employment in the US is in small and medium sized enterprises. So that tells you that if the problem really is that small coffee shops are not able to open their doors, they don't have any revenue. If the problem is that small retailers, that, two, that various parts of the retail space and various parts of the consumer uh, spectrum are not able to keep their doors open, well, then the problem really is at the end of the day, how do you keep the, um, uh, the corporate sector afloat? How do you get money to the corporate sector very quickly? And this chart here shows you that this is not just about S&P 500 companies. It's actually much more, namely 85% 
of employment being in small businesses is much more about helping small businesses. And that's, of course, the challenge for fiscal policy overall. Can you say a few words? Do you think Europe is, can weather the shock better because of this social welfare state, which uh, kicks in automatically in the US with a lot of freelancing uh, economy, uh, again, economy might be hit much harder. Can you make a defense and what are the implications for the fault on household debt? Yeah, and this is an extremely important question. And this chart that we're looking at here is exactly trying to answer that. Uh, the first answer, of course, is that it all depends on containment strategies. So we can then debate whether different countries are doing too little or too much, and is the government doing containment strategy or is the private sector doing enough containment strategy? But one very important part of your question, Marcus, is this chart here. This is for the US. If you look at the text below the title, this is a percentage of private industry workers with access to paid sick leave. And as you can see, generally speaking, lower income households in the US generally tends to have less paid sick leave. And if that's the case, then you begin to think about the question, well, if there are fewer people in the lower income groups who have access to paid sick leave, well, then you begin to think about situations where people say, well, I can't just afford to stay home as a sick worker because I don't get compensated by my employer or the government. So as a result of that, I know I may be sick, but I still decide to go to work. So as I've written in the title of this chart here, coronavirus is likely to have a bigger impact on low income groups. And given that paid sick leave is less pronounced in the US at the average level, the answer to your question is, um, at least from a welfare state and social safety net perspective at the broadest level, that um, those countries that have paid sick leave, those countries, and the US is of course working on introducing this now, exactly because of this chart here, those countries that have paid sick leave, at least in the most partial consideration, are likely to also have less spreading of the disease and are therefore also likely at least to have less problems in terms of the negative economic consequences because not only is paid sick leave something to do with the spreading of the disease, but of course it also has everything to do with whether you actually get a salary while you're staying at home and is sick at the same time. Another aspect of that is of course what's going on with the gig economy, as you know too well, uh, this chart here is the data that came out from the BLS uh, now uh, last year. This is the number of uh, contingent workers, which is another way of saying this is the number of people who work in the gig economy. And the blue bar shows you on the left scale that there's roughly in round numbers about 6 million gig workers, meaning people who just work jobs uh, that are temporary and then take another job that's also temporary. And generally speaking, they tend to not have healthcare, which is the next page. This chart here shows you, if you look at the text below the title, employed contingent and non-contingent workers by health insurance coverage. And as you can see, generally contingent workers, which is a complicated way of saying gig workers or people who have temporary jobs, generally have less health care and therefore also are at risk, both in terms of costs of health care, but also in terms of the risk that they might consider just taking jobs and going to work, even in a situation where they, uh, in other circumstances, might have decided to stay home. So that also gets to your question, Marcus, about uh, that the risks, unfortunately, are that those countries that have uh, uh, less social safety nets on paid sick leave on healthcare uh, is unfortunately a little bit higher in terms of the overall impact in the spreading of the virus. So finally, uh, let me just skate through this very quickly. We tried to look at the fiscal packages that have been announced and I'm not going to go through this. You all uh, follow this in great detail. Different countries have done different things, uh, but it is important, of course, that different countries are doing whatever they can to try to stem the spreading of the virus and try to limit the negative consequences for the economy. So we're doing another, a little bit longer because a lot of questions lining up, uh, in particular, the questions about the long run implications on growth and inflation versus deflation. If you could focus on that, uh, there are several questions and perhaps say a few words on algorithmic trading, whether that's something to ignore or is it important to understand what's going on? Yeah, okay. So the, the, the first important question, namely, uh, what are the long-term consequences? Uh, th this chart here, just now that we have it up, looks at some of that from a short-term perspective. Uh, here, and again, this uh, correlation here is not particularly impressive, but at least it gives you a, a slight idea about uh, what might be coming on the real economy. Uh, S&P 500 is the red line and the blue line is non-farm payrolls being jobs. Uh, and you do get quite worried when you could see here that suddenly you could see a quite substantial risk of a drop in employment if we do follow the red line down in any shape and form. 
of course, the employment numbers, it still takes a few weeks before we get that for March. Uh, but the jobless claims number today, uh, unfortunately, confirm our fears that the labor market is not doing particularly well. Uh, to the question, a much longer answer about what are the long-term consequences? Well, the risk, of course, is that consumers now, after this is over and the virus is gone, will have a savings rate that potentially could be a lot higher. Uh, there's a lot of statistics, as you know, from the survey of consumer finance. It's showing that households in the U.S. have difficulty, about half of households have difficulties coming up with $400 if there was an emergency. Uh, similar statistics from other surveys from Gallup also show the same picture. So one regime switch, we, a regime change we are going to see is we're probably going to see a structurally higher savings rate once we get for the household sector, once we get to the other side. Similarly, we'll probably also see a higher savings rate in the corporate sector once we get to the other side, mainly because the corporate sector now suddenly out of the blue experienced a shock where they realized that they had too little cash and therefore cash holdings might also begin to see a boost higher for the corporate sector. And finally, of course, for the government sector, uh, it's probably also a good guess that the government will also begin to think more about how can we prepare, prepare ourselves for uh, another pandemic risk that might be coming in the future so that we don't get into this situation and this very unfortunate uh, experience and episode that we're going through at the moment. Do you expect that everybody wants to hold safe assets and nobody wants to go into risky assets anymore? So as you know, uh, uh, that there were a lot of papers that looked at the depression in the 1930s and one of the papers uh, titled Depression Babies showed that people who grew up during the depression exactly got so risk averse that they essentially never bought stocks in very broad terms. And therefore you could also ask people who grow up now and experience this shock that we're sitting through might also begin to say, well, uh, I didn't appreciate that my carry trade could underperform. I didn't appreciate that the risk parity trade uh, could break down this way. I didn't appreciate that liquidity in markets could be such an important factor in breaking down correlations between treasury rates and equities that had been in place for a very, very long time, which to a very important debate gets to the discussion about quant models. There's a lot of quant models at the moment that are seeing a correlation breakdown, not because these markets and these underlying fundamental views on assets have changed, but really because of the liquidity situation being so different and some markets being essentially, at least until recently, closed and other markets being extremely liquid, whereby people start to sell all the liquid markets. In other words, it becomes a whole new dimension to debate what assets do I want to buy? Do I want to buy assets that have high returns only? Or do I actually also want to take into account that I also want to have some assets only and purely because they're liquid? And if you want, want to have assets purely because they're liquid, then it becomes a, another debate than saying I'm only ranking my assets according to returns, but instead saying I'm ranking my assets according to how liquid they are. So for, for a portfolio and from a finance uh, theory perspective, uh, this is opening up a whole new avenue of research in terms of thinking about what are the factors that go into how I construct my portfolio because liquidity is certainly becoming a very important factor in terms of which assets I want to buy and I don't want to buy. The final thing, and then I will stop, uh, is to look at, of course, uh, the first question that we should have asked ourselves, namely, are there any parallels in history in terms of understanding how long time will this take? And the only parallel we really have is what you saw in 1918, 1919, which is what I have plotted here. This is, if you look at the text below the title, the number of months that the US economy was in a recession. And as you can see, the recession we had in 1918 only lasted seven months. And remember in 1918, uh, of course, we had uh, the pandemic flu. Uh, and I remember at the time, about a third of the world population got infected and 5% of the world population uh, died as a result of the 1918, 1919. Uh, pandemic flu. So now you could say, okay, well, that gives my, me some confidence and that gives us some confidence in our own forecasting that we are probably going to see something that's deep, but relatively short. That's not to say that this will go away in, uh, tomorrow or even next week or the week after, but it's just to say that, well, at least historically, the main parallel we have in 1918, 1919, it was at least a relatively short recession compared to what we have seen, as you can see in the chart in other recessions. And this has to do with the general idea that a lot of reasons why these other recessions took longer was that we be was because of some homegrown issue. For example, in 2006, we had imbalances in the housing market. In 2000, we had imbalances in the IT sector. In 1990, we had imbalances in the commercial real estate sector. So once those sectors started to slow down and started to fall, then you needed some adjustment. And that adjustment took time. It took time 
to correct those imbalances. But today, we're not really having any imbalance that has been the endogenous reason why we're seeing a recession. So in that sense, we come to the conclusion that this came literally out of the blue. This is the definition of an exogenous shock. So we didn't have to correct any imbalance the same way that we had in 2008, the same way we had in 2000, and the same way that we had in 1990. So in that sense, a lot of the distress that we're seeing is purely, and it comes back to this all the time, a function of when will the curve begin to flatten out the chart that you had in the beginning, Marcus? When will the curve begin to show signs that things are getting better in terms of the virus at least stabilizing and getting into the scenarios that we've seen in China, Korea, and in Japan? So let me just end up showing you our forecast in Deutsche Bank that we just released. Uh, this is why we have, if you look just at the upper left-hand chart, let me just talk about that for world GDP. Uh, and of course, world GDP here, we have very weak in the second quarter and then rebounding in Q3 and in Q4, and then going back to the baseline again. If you look at the right upper hand chart, this is US GDP growth. Uh, we will see US GDP growth on a Q or Q annualized rate dro drop by, in our calculation, more than 10%. This is the biggest drop in GDP in any quarter since World War II. So we are saying this is definitely serious, and this is what we mean by deep, but short is, as you can see in the chart, the V-shape recovery that we do get back up and expect once the virus begins to stabilize and the market gets the idea that the virus is stabilizing, we should begin to see when we get into Q3 and Q4 GDP growth be a little bit higher, namely in our calculations there, um, moving uh, modestly up around uh, three, four, five percent, but then begin to flatten out and come down on the lower line again. And so with that, uh, let me stop there and um, forgive me for running a little bit over time, uh, but uh, see if there are any additional questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Thorsten. It's fantastic to have all these uh, great views from you and all these slides to provide some fundamental research how things might play out. Let's just go through some questions which I couldn't handle so far. There are a lot of questions which came in. So in particular, there's some concern that all this free and cheap money, so Brian Schneider asks, uh, will this lead to another asset bubble uh, later on? So we have this huge run-up of corporate debt. Is this then going back, so if it's a V-shaped thing, will we go back to this huge run-up of corporate debt or will we not see a recovery of the corporate debt level to such? So it might not be V-shaped because the corporate debt is essentially not, you can't sell it off. So That's a very important question. I, I said just a minute ago that this was purely exogenous and there were no imbalances causing the recession. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have quite a build-up of debt in the last 10 years after the financial crisis. And given that a lot of the buildup of debt was exactly in the corporate sector, then a very, very broad way of thinking about what's going on is that in 2006, 2007, we saw the crisis hit the banking sector balance sheet. Then it spread to the household sector balance sheet. So what was relatively spared in that crisis was the corporate sector balance sheet. So that's why, to this very important question, the corporate sector balance sheet, therefore, has been doing a lot of different things and has been expanding in size, as I showed you the chart, that the size of US credit markets has grown quite dramatically. The corporate balance sheet has sort of become more vulnerable simply because it wasn't part of the crisis in 2008 and 9, and it wasn't really part of the crisis either in 1990. So in that sense, the corporate balance sheet was, for better or worse, just more vulnerable going into this situation that we have come into now. And it was mainly vulnerable, not because of a solvency question, but really more because of a liquidity question. That's why all these charts about commercial paper, funding markets, everything that has to do with getting cash to companies. There's a lot of people in financial markets and in money markets and the financial system at the moment that's scrambling to get cash. And why is that this scramble to get cash? Well, the scramble to get cash at the moment has everything to do with the fact that when the doors are closed in stores, when businesses are shut, that means that businesses don't get the revenue. They don't get the cash flow that they normally get. And corporates didn't calculate and they didn't count on a significant drop down in the number of cash that was coming in. So think about this as an airline. Airlines had been counting on cash coming in. And if therefore from one day to the other that there's suddenly no one is flying, then of course the incoming cash is essentially in round numbers close to zero. And if that's the case, they need to then scramble to quickly raise some cash to keep the lights on, to keep their workers working, to make sure that their businesses are still running. And this basically creates a significant need for raising cash, which ultimately then ends up through selling of equities, 
through selling of treasuries because they are the most liquid markets where you can raise cash and where that cash can come around very, very quickly. So therefore to the question that you just asked, which is very good, namely that, okay, so, so we then worry about what the consequences are of what the Fed and the ECB is doing and what even the governments are doing to try to keep the economies afloat. I would say that at the moment, it's mainly about making sure that we limit the downside risk from a cyclical perspective so that companies can stay afloat so that they can pay their workers, so that workers get paid sick leave, so that workers get health care, so that health services are trying to limit the negative consequences. Because the more we limit the negative consequences and the negative impact on the economy, the more we will also be able to smoothen out uh, this shock over time. And therefore, the debt levels are significant on their own, but they are mainly significant in the sense that the problem today is not so much an insolvency issue across the board. There are, of course, some insolvency issues at the lower end of the credit spectrum in terms of lower credit rated. And of course, as I spoke about, energy also has some debates about that. But generally speaking, across the board, corporate America is still doing relatively fine. The only issue is that they just need cash to sit through these few weeks, or in the worst case, few months that it's going to take before the virus starts to subside. So can I just uh, follow up on this? Would you argue that, you know, while we had QE buying mortgage backed securities in the last crisis, now QE should focus on buying corporate bonds in order to, uh, is this a different implications? Like in Japan in 1990s, it's more the corporate sector's difficulties, had implications for QE measures and other measures. And then a lot of questions like lending cars and cartons from, I mean, before tankers asked about the strictness of the containment strategies and what are the implications for that. And similarly, chief economist of Sparitank, uh, Knudsen, asked, what do you think test containment? Should we be very strict, very sharp in order to ensure V shape, or should we smooth it out uh, from an economic perspective? Um, so the questions along that line. Yeah, so the, the first question is very important. Uh, there are some legal restrictions, as you also, of course, know too well, in terms of what different central banks can do. The ECB yesterday evening, uh, and just as a footnote, let's not forget this, uh, the fact that the ECB uh, puts out anything uh, at midnight on a Wednesday is, uh, to put it mildly, very unusual. So the ECB exactly launched the $750 billion program that essentially says that they can buy any asset at any time in any size. There was some discussions about the capital key and what exactly kind of assets could they buy and when they should buy it. But the bottom line is that DCB is trying to step in and say, we are showing a willingness to also support corporate credit markets because corporate credit markets, again, remember, if we just back up, this whole shock is at the moment now in the corporate sector. So this is all about making sure that the corporate sector can have cash, can stay afloat, and that the corporate sector can pay their workers. So with that backdrop, the central banks, of course, have different tools and the Federal Reserve, most importantly, under 13.3 emergency rules, can do a lot of different things. But as a starting point, the Fed simply cannot buy corporate credit. Uh, the Fed has tried to do different facilities, the primary dealer credit facility that they also just announced a few days ago, which is an attempt to try to soften some of these stresses that we saw in the charts in credit markets. But it gets back to what we talk about all the time in this debate here, namely that it really is critical to remember that it all at the end of the day is about the corporate sector. And that's why credit markets and keeping credit markets afloat and making sure that credit markets are functioning so that companies can raise cash, so that companies have access to cash to make sure that they can pay their workers so that they're sure that they can keep humming. And this feeds into the other question that you mentioned, namely, uh, why should it be a V-shape? Should it be smoothened out or shouldn't we just have a very, very sharp downturn and then we can just see what eventually happens. The risk, of course, with that is that once you begin to think about what the business cycle is doing over time, it becomes very important also to keep in mind that if the unemployment rate, let's say that in the extreme, the unemployment rate over the next several months goes up to uh, uh, whatever, let's just throw out a number, uh, more than 5% or in the worst, very, very worst case goes up to 10%, then you will unfortunately have a mismatch problem where a lot of people will be fired and a lot of people will be mismatched from the labor market. And it actually takes always time. We saw that in 2009 and onwards, it takes time to match workers with employers over time. You could say, well, they could just hire them back very quickly, but the costs in terms of paying unemployment insurance for people who are unemployed, the cost of people getting thrown out of the labor market and suddenly not having money to buy cars, to go shopping, to buy houses, 
it just creates some magnified effects at the macro level, which makes it very undesirable to have big swings in the unemployment rate or big swings in the economy. So from an economic planning perspective, it is always much more attractive to smooth out the swings in the business cycle and make sure that we have as limited as a decline in the economy as possible. And then an adjustment that hopefully come back, comes back relatively quickly. That's why in the forecast that I ended up showing you here, we do have that this will only last a quarter. And we do think that we will go back. That tremendously a function of, and, and hugely a function of what you're seeing and, and the debate about that is usually a function of what you're seeing in terms of how long time the virus will continue. I want to raise one more question, one scheme. One is emerging economies and uh, the dollar. And there are some questions out of Africa. The European boy from Kenya asked uh, what you see about Africa in particular. Do you watch Africa, whether the virus is breaking out there, whether the virus can sustain a warm climate or not? And what is this information for you to forecast? And to what extent, you know, you see difficulties in emerging economies, like to safety to the dollar and dislocation on the currency market, huge defaults in emerging economies. Absolutely. This I, so this is a very important question. I mean, as we have seen this flight to safety, basically a lot of money going into US treasuries. And while at the same time, remember that treasury rates actually more recently have gone up because people have been selling. So there's a lot of people that have been selling treasuries. The volumes in all financial markets that are liquid, meaning equities and treasuries have just been enormous because there's a lot of people who have a need to buy treasuries because they want safe assets. And there's a lot of people that have a need to sell treasuries because they need cash. So this is about different balance sheets, different participants in financial markets having different needs coming together and say, I would like to buy some treasuries because now I'm worried about what's going on in the rest of the world. Or vice versa, people who say, I would like to sell treasuries because I have a cash need if I'm a corporate or if I'm an institution that mm -hmm. has experienced redemptions in my would fund. Would you have to have some holes on this or would it count to be, be counterproductive to scare the market even more? Some question asked, like Julius Woods asked, would, should we have some trading holes also on the treasury market? So that's, of course, a, a, an important and difficult question. I mean, the idea with the trading holes is to sort of take a, a timeout a basketball style and say, let's just uh, figure out exactly what's going on and, and whether everything is functioning the way that it should. And so the circuit breakers, uh, they are very different in different markets, and some markets don't have circuit breakers. Um, in particular, of course, FX. But um, the, 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 back to the question you asked, first name here about emerging markets. The issue is that U.S. Treasuries is perceived to be the safest asset in the world always. Uh, and this then brings us back to the discussion, well, okay, if there's worries about how other countries are dealing with the virus, the negative impact on the economies around the world, and if there's an issue in emerging markets, whether they can or cannot deal with the virus, whether it's better in warmer weather or not, I, I have no views on all that. I'm just saying that um, we are observing definitely that emerging markets are taking quite a hit uh, in this period um, uh, as a reflection of people saying they are more worried about some of the consequences for emerging markets uh, and therefore would rather be in U.S. treasuries. So in that sense, this is not only about, I spoke a lot about uh, European and Asian investors, uh, meaning Japanese investors buying U.S. credit, but a lot of this debate also feeds into this issue of uh, emerging markets assets um, relative to U.S. treasuries, the safe haven assets. So it's, it's in, in some language we're switching between which model is it that's driving markets. I mean, sometimes we sit and talk about, is the stock market driven by growth or is it driven by value? So that's not the debate at all we had today. Now the stock market is driven by something completely different. And from a regime switching perspective in fixed income, we have now switched into a whole different model that markets are now driven almost entirely by views on uh, risk-free assets and the safest asset in the world, namely US treasuries in very crude terms, basically more or less relative to everything else. And that's driving a lot of views in terms of, well, do I need cash? Do I need risk-free assets? And if that's the case, then my investment portfolio should be organized around those two important questions, which are very different from normally when you put together a portfolio, you say, well, what are the returns of the assets that I'm looking at? What is the profile? And what can I get if I invest in this rated asset relative to this rated asset? Thanks a lot, Thorsten. That's fantastic. Uh, many questions, many people ask whether we can have the slides. I think we will make the slide available. Let's find a few, Thorsten. And we will actually also have recorded it. And as soon as Zoom has compressed the video and uh, feasible format, 
we also will make the video available if people want to watch it or recommend it to their friends. Overall, a, a big applause to Thorsten. I'm the only one who can probably is unmuted. My pleasure. And uh, we're very grateful that you introduced us to the world of Wall Street and finance and the implications of the coronavirus for the general economy as a whole. And thanks to all viewers and thanks for holding out till the end. It was great to have you around. We will try to do another one pretty soon and uh, hope to see you again. And for more insights, stay in touch. Thanks again. Thank you.